بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدنيا والدين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبي خاتم النبيين وآله وصحبه أجمعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم طيب so we start off today إن شاء الله تعالى with recapping the names then some biographical information about the wives of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم so we memorize the poem, or we memorize the rajz, rajz about the names of the wives of the Prophet How many wives did the Prophet have? Eleven. How many did he die with? Nine. 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 Excellent. Which ones died before him? Quick question. What? Not Musalam. Musalam was the last of his wife to die. Khadija and who? And Zainab. One of the Zainabs. Okay. Tayyip. Excellent. Excellent work. So what are their names? Let's go. Hafsa is that? Hafsa who? Hafsa bin Umar. Oh, you forgot Hafsa bin Umar. Astaghfirullah. I was counting nine, I forgot to count the other two. Uh, Hafsa bin Umar. Juwayriya bin who? Harith. Harith. Tayyip. Zainab bin Jahsha. Zainab bin Jahsha was Zainab who? Zainab bin Zainab. MashaAllah. Excellent. So that's Hajjah, is that right? What's next? Safir bin Safir is what? Safir bin Safir. Safir bin who? Okay, who? What's next? Khuwaylid, excellent, next. Excellent, next. Sawda bin Zam'a. When did he marry Sawda? During the second. After who? After Khalidah. After Khalidah, Radiallahu Anha, died, right? Tayyip. Meem. Aisha. Meem. Maymuna bint al-Harith. Maymuna bint al-Harith. Ayn. In the hat. So one of the brothers they, they mentioned Maria al Qutiya. They mentioned that Maria was considered to be the right hand possession of the Prophet, meaning that he did not take her as a wife in the common understanding of a wife, but he was able to enjoy her or have her have her. For better for lack of better words. Then the question comes up, is it permissible for men today to have concubines, for lack of better words? Uh, one, when the question comes up, the important thing to remember is that our deen remains until the time of Yom Qiyam. Our deen remains until the time of as long as there is nothing that makes it mansukh and the abrogated, that we say that it continues to be permissible. Well, Allah tells us in the Quran, well, Allah tells us in the Quran, those who preserve their furuz, right? Their furuz whom illa illa as well as your own man of the So Allah says, wives and so it's like saying, you know, can we have wives still? Of course we can still have wives. Now, the question is, is, is availability. If it's available, and you're not going to get yourself in trouble with the local law, right, then it's permissible. But would, it be, would you say that you would take this in America and say, oh, I have a slave woman here. It's okay. It's not permissible by the laws of the country. You're going to get yourself in trouble. But in some countries, it's still permissible and it's happening. Some countries, it's still permissible and happening. Uh, I'm not certain if it is completely still happening, but the last time I heard in Mauritania, it was still being practiced that some people had slaves. And in some other countries, it also happens, maybe not so uh, 
common in me, but it happens. That people have slaves, you can buy a slave. And we have to remember that slavery in Islam is not the same as it is, or as it's understood in Western terms. You know, it's not the same as chattel slavery that happened here in America. Slavery in Islam is a system that is respectable. And the person has to be treated with a certain level of respect. They eat what you eat, the clothes that you clothe, the work that they're given is not to be uh, more than you would be able to do yourself, and so on and so forth. So we don't have a shame in our deen at all. Allah said it's permissible. Again, we accept it as being permissible where it may be practiced at without trouble. Where it may be practiced without trouble. Tell you. Yeah, this is wrong. Assalamu alaikum. Tell you, does it make sense? What I know, well, I remember one Sheikh, uh, one Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Salim, he used to tell the people in Mauritania, he wouldn't allow everyone to buy a slave. It's not just, oh, I have the money. No, because some people are idiots. Some people are ignorant, fools, and they'll treat the human being improperly. They're human beings. You know, so you don't marry a slave just to, as some people might think, just to do what you want to do and then sell her off. That's not how it works. I'm done with you, I'm going to sell you. These are human beings, and we're Muslims. You don't treat a human being just like a piece of property. It's not what Islam teaches us. So it's not just a piece of property that you, you know, put the t-shirt on and you take it off as you want. They're human beings still. So you have to treat them as such. Or you don't deserve to have that test, because it's a test. You have someone working for you in this type of fashion, it's a test for the owner and a test for the owned. Are you going to be just, or are you going to be unjust? The reality we have to remember, Allah is going to ask us about this on Yom Al-Qiyam. So it's not a just free for all thing as some people might think. Allah is going to ask you about how you treated this person who was under your authority on Yom Al-Qiyam. So it's something to pay attention to closely. Taiwan? Yes? No? Does anyone have any special information about any of the wives? Yes, we have. Like, Tell me something. Out of book? Or like outside of the book? Uh, from your head. It's your mother's. For um, Hafsa, she's the daughter of Ahmad bin Khattab. We know this. <laughs> tell us something we don't know. Um, or tell us something that wasn't in the book. Let's put that one. I have everything from the book. Huh? I have everything from the book. No, I asked for special stuff, not from the book. Did you find anything else? Anyone find anything else? Did anyone look up anything else? The say that. So let's say, yeah, I'll combine Habs and Aish. Say it again? I'll just combine Habs and Aish and this, and then they give you the Taqsa uh, uh, and I'll give you a whole story about that. Uh, <laughs> it's a long story, but, you know. No, I mean, like, special uh, traits about them. Oh, traits? Okay. Like, Aisha was known to be, what is someone? I'm going to give it to you. Aisha was a virgin? The only virgin married? Well, that's, I mean, yeah. But characteristics, like if someone asks you about your mother, you can say, oh, my mother does this, da, 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 da. These are our mothers. We should know something about them, the same way we know about the Prophet We should know about their characteristics. Which one did the wives of the Prophet say? Which wife of the Prophet say that Aisha was Aisha the most, uh, that the Aisha say was the most, you know, closer to her, the Prophet said something as her? Who? Khadija. No, after Khadija. You know, which one, you know, battled Aisha, you know, which one, you know, did this, which one had this cat, which one was the most calmest, which one gave the most sadaqah? These things we should know. Look it up, inshallah. Tell you, we'll start. The Prophet here we're on page 32, his history, the history of the Prophet Before prophethood, before prophethood, his birth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was born in Mecca in the year of the elephant, on Monday in the month Rabbi al awwal 53 years before Hijrah, corresponding to the year 571 CE, Christian era, Allah's withholding of the elephant was a dedication to the Prophet in his sacred house. Tayyip. So, we said before, there's a narration that comes on the authority of Ibn Abbas, anhu, uh, they said the Prophet was born on the 12th of Rabbi al awwal And this narration is authentic, so we accept. 
We said he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal on Monday in the year 571, 570, whichever one is closer. It's different sort of opinion about 570 or 571. What month is that corresponding to in the English cal or in the calendar? April 1st. They sign, right? So that's what, April? Excellent. Um, his father's name was Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. He passed away before the Prophet ﷺ was born. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ was born an orphan. Again, an orphan is a person who has no father. An orphan is a person whose father has passed away, not whose mother has passed away. Islamically, the orphan, the yatim, is the person whose father has passed away. Why is that? Anyone know why? Father is the one who's going to take care of him, provide for him, protect him, right? So a person loses their father, even though the ladies don't consider the father to be that important. Islam considers the father to be very important, all right? If you lose your father, you lost your protection, your senate, you who you're going to lean on, right? Now, his mother, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was Amin ibn Wahab from the tribe of Banu Zuhra. Or Zahab, she passed away before the Prophet ﷺ was seven years old. She passed away when he was young, before he was seven years old. His Wasallam's carers, or I guess caretakers. After his mother passed away, he was then placed in the care of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, who passed away while the Prophet ﷺ was eight years old. He was then placed in the care of his paternal uncle, Abu Talib, whose real name is Abdul Manaf. His foster mothers, Fawaybah. The slave of Abu Lahab, she also nursed Abu Salama, Abdullah bin Abu Asad, al Makhzumi with the milk for her son Masroor. She also nursed the Prophet's uncle, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. And this is why there's a story that comes one time where Um Salama had. No, it's not. Then we have Halima al Sa'diyya. She nursed him from the milk of her son, Abdullah. Brother of Anisa and Jubama, better known as Shayma, the children of Al Harib ibn Abdul Uzza ibn Rafa'a, Al Sa'adi, his uncle Abu Sufyan was also nursed with him. What, what's the importance of knowing whose milk she nursed him by? Does anyone know? Why is it important to know who was nursed by the same time or who was the father of the child? I'll give you an example, right? Why does it say she nursed him from the milk of her son Abdullah, brother of Anisa and Jubama, better known as Shayma? Why is it important to know the father of the child that the mother had milk from? Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Got it. Okay. A mother, a person to give wet milk, a wet nurse, got it. a wet nurse is a woman who either just had a baby and still has breast milk and she gives it to another child that's not her child. Do you understand what I just said? Okay. How does this happen? She had to have just had a baby, meaning she was impregnated by a man, right? Her husband. Why is it important to know who the husband is? Because it's due to him for the baby having milk. Hey, mashallah, yeah, they keep smart young man. The milk belongs to the father in reality. The milk comes from the man. Not exactly. But the milk is formed due to whatever the milk spot and everything that comes from the man inside of the woman and forms the baby. So that baby, the milk that comes is actually a mixture of the man and the woman's DNA, blood. Do you see that? How, how Islam, how perfect Islam is? So the father of the child also becomes a parent to the child that was breastfed, even though he didn't breastfeed her or her. But he becomes mahram for that child because in reality it was his milk, or it was part of his body that made the mother pregnant, uh, that she gave breast milk for. So that breast milk that mixed with the other child is part of his DNA as well. Not just the mother's milk. So, if a person is married, let's say a man is married to a woman, and that man's wife breastfeeds another child, right? During a time, six, seven, eight, nine, during a time where that's all the child is eating, nothing else but breast milk, right? The father and the mother become mahram for that child. He can never marry her, she can never marry him. You understand? And as well, the brothers and sisters from these two can never marry that child. 
That's why sometimes you'll see that the Prophet Sallallahu if somebody will offer, like when Sallallahu Alaihi said that she, was, she wanted to offer, uh, she was worried that um, the Prophet Sallallahu would marry um, someone that was close to her, right? And he said, you know, I can't marry her. One, it's my brother from, it's the daughter of my brother who I was breastfed by, Thuwayla, Thuwayla, that we both had the same wet nurse. So I can't marry her. Well, she's mahram for me. And also, you don't offer your daughter to me because of our relationship. Right? So that's important to understand. That if two, if the, the people who share the same milk, those brothers, they become actual brothers and sisters. They cannot ever marry each other. Ever. So step question no. so, so I was, you know, mentioned the surah Barakah. Mm -hmm. So for the men, you know, for the wife, she could actually excel them more. So that's yeah, that, that, that you pay you pay the, the lady. No. The the no, no. What's the question? So that So if she wife has to say you know, you pay me Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's not it's not it's, it's 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 payment because of the fact that she's still taking care of your child more. So not you know, she's still taking care of the child and you're paying her and take, taking care of her uh, her needs while doing such. No. But, also in that vein, we know that it is an obligation of the woman to breastfeed the child. The child should be breastfed. It's another, like, we'll see that, a crime, actually, that the women today, they do to their children. They give them this powdered milk. It's a crime. May Allah guide the women to leave this off. This is a crime against the children. It's an oppression that a woman, instead of breastfeeding the child and giving the child good vitamins and nutrients and the connection to the mother that the child needs at this age, they scoop out powder out of a can and put water in it and give the baby this thing. It's a crime. It's not the Islamic way. It's not healthy for the child. It does not help the development of the child. It does not build the connection between the mother and the child that is needed at this time. And as well, if the woman knew this, they would never do it. It doesn't help the woman become her stomach to shrink back up properly after having the child. If she breastfeeds, it allows Abdurrahman, Khaled, it does not allow her to, uh, her stomach, one of the benefits of breastfeeding is that it helps the woman's stomach shrink back up. And this is why sometimes the ladies, their stomachs don't shrink back up and they don't look healthy. Why? Right? Because instead of breastfeeding the child as a law decreed and is wanted for them, they rushed and gave the baby Similac. And why do they do this? So they can run back to work. It's a crime on the mother and the father. They want to run back to work, so they want to send the baby to daycare because they want to go to work. No, the father should go work harder. And the lady should stay at home, not send the baby to daycare. May Allah guide us. We're making a big mistake. The people are making a huge mistake giving the baby Similac. Here, put this in the bottle and send the baby to daycare. The baby's one month old. It needs to be with his mother. Two months old, it needs to be with his mother. Five months, six, the baby needs to be with his mother. It's a crime. If the person doesn't want to take care of the child, don't want to have children. Just send the child to daycare. Anyway, his wet nurses was Halima, Prince Abu Dhuayb, the Saadiya, Thuayba, Thuayba, the slave Abu Lahab, and his mother Amina. As well, Shayma, the daughter of Halima and father sister of the Prophet, she's the one who came to among, among the delegation of the Hawazin, a tribe from amongst those who wanted to fight against the Prophet after the conquest of Mecca. So he spread his garment for her to sit down, observing her rights as his foster sister, but also as a wet nurse. So she must have also given him milk. His wet nurses also was Um Ayman, Baraka al Habashiya. So this lady she was. You know, Habasha, I would, I would say she was Ethiopian, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. I'm going to tell you. We would say she was Ethiopian, right? 
The Sheikh here is happy to think that she was blessed <laughs> by Ethiopian lady, right? But in justice, out of justice, we can't say she was Ethiopian. Habasha, during that time, was the area that is now known as Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea. So these three, so she could have been Somali, Ethiopian, or Eritrean. Maybe she was Somali. Maybe she was Somali. Maybe she was Eritrean, or maybe she was from the land known as Ethiopian today. But historically, Somalia, Ethiopia, and in Ethiopia were all considered Habasha. Until, you know, recent, more recent times, they broke it smaller. Habasha was a huge land. And all of these lands that encompass the Somalian people, Eritrean people, and Ethiopian people were all considered Habasha. Right? So, we know that she was Habashi, which she was Allah Maybe she was Ethiopian Muslim. Right? <laughs> so, Baraka al Habashiya, the Prophet Sallallahu had inherited her, inherited her from his father, and she had been his wet nurse. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her to Zayd bin Haritha, and she then bore their son, Usama bin Zayd. She was also the one who Abu Bakr and Omar visited after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi while she had been crying. So they said to her, why do you cry? Show you what Allah has for the Prophet is better. She replied, I know what Allah has, the pro has, the pro has for the Prophet is better, and that he is not in a better situation. However, I cry because the revelation has stopped coming from the heavens. This caused them both to also cry with him. Think about this, subhanAllah. The Sahaba who just witnessed the revelation of the Quran coming down, they understood how important it was for guidance to be coming down consistently from the sky. That when they had a situation, the Quran came and revealed the answer. Now look at us 1,400 years later. The deen is sealed, alhamdulillah. But do we realize how important the guidance is in the Quran? That if we really wanted guidance, that there's nothing we cannot find of the answer in the Quran. And Shaykh Abdullah, the Shafiti, he said, This is easy to say, right? Everyone understands that guidance is in the Quran, correct? How do you get it? How do you get the, the guidance that's out of the Quran? He said that you will not get this guidance unless you accompany the Quran. What does that mean? That you become a person of the Quran, literally, that you're reading it. Constantly, whenever you have a free minute, the, you take to the Quran. That's the only way that you're really going to get the guidance and be able to benefit and change your life by the Quran is that you make the Quran your companion. Otherwise, it doesn't benefit that way. You have to be reading it constantly, constantly seeking guidance from, seeking guidance from. You can't see guidance from anywhere else. You have to make the Quran your companion. If you want to answer, ask the Quran. It's there. It's the kalam of Allah. You want Nusra? Ask the Quran. It's there. It's the Kalam of Allah. Right? And Allah blesses us to make the Quran our companions in this life, and hopefully Allah will allow it to accompany us in our graves. Amen. So Umayman and the companions, they understood this. And Umayman, now you see the connections between the people. That's what's important. You see the connections. She was the mother of who? Who? Usama bin Zayn. Do you know who he was? Usama bin Zayn? The Prophet said him sent him to lead a whole army at the age of what? 15 or 17? 17, I think, right? 18? 17, 18? What are we doing at 18? What are we doing? Playing Fortnite, yeah. Right? He was sent as the leader of a whole army to go conquer a land, defend from a certain situation. Osama bin Zayn was the beloved one to the Prophet Sallallahu The son of the beloved one. Who was his father? Zayd. Do you know who Zayd was? The one that the Prophet Sallallahu used to call his son. His adopted son. Huh? SubhanAllah. 17, 18 years old. Leading an army, a general. Do you know how you become a general at 17, 18 years old? Do you know how? Not by playing video games. That means you've been being trained for this from a young age. And they say that we're rough and we tell the boys, get off the wall. All right? So to sit up, straighten your back up, right? They say, oh, why are you being so they're only chill, they're only 15, 16. He was a general of the army, meaning his mind was able to be able to tell the army, you go this way, you go this way, and not be able to fold under pressure. That takes practice, it takes upbringing and tarbiyah to build a person to that age that at 18 years old, they can lead a whole army 
and be trusted by the prophets or some of the dudes that accomplish the task. We have to start taking our lives more serious. 17, 18 year old young men, you're not boys, you're young men. Islamically, you're capable of being a general in the army at this age of 18. So I mean, at 15, 16, you should be preparing your mind mentally for this. By how? You should be reading, studying strategy. Stu reading, 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 reading. You can't, you can't understand how important it is to read. Read as much as you can. Well, why they tricked us so much with video games. Oh, it makes you, it dumbs you down. It dumbs you down, you can't even think real anymore. It's not, your thought process is no longer realistic. You think that you can jump through walls now. You know? Your thought process isn't even real. That if you think if you get enough points, you can jump through the wall, or that you know you're gonna pick up an extra. No, you need to read, increase in your reading. So think about these things. When you think about the lives of the prophet, the companions, think about who they, what they were doing at our age. Alright? His work, Salah said, he used to tend to sheep, and this was a reason for his level of patience and mercy and concern towards the needy and the weak. The Messenger of Allah so said, he said, every prophet has tended sheep. He was asked, and did you? He replied, yes, I tended them for a few carrots for the Meccans. So he tended the sheep as well. His business and marriage. When he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 25 years old, he left for Syria for business. After he returned, he married his wife, first wife, Khadija bint Khuwaylid, radiallahu anha. Building of the Kaaba. When he was 35 years old, the Kaaba had been destroyed, so the Quraysh decided to rebuild it and distribute it different duties among the different tribes of the Quraysh. However, when it came to the corner, to corner of the black stone, they began to dispute who would lift the black stone back to its place. This dispute continued for up to five nights until they agreed the next man to enter the masjid would judge between them. This man was the Prophet Sallallahu He commanded each tribe to hold a corner of a piece of cloth with the black stone on top of it, when they raised it, he placed it in his correct place. It's an honor that Allah gave to him, right? That he was able to put the black stone in his place. MashaAllah. Seclusion. Aisha radiallahu anha said the love of seclusion was bestowed upon him. What does seclusion mean? Staying by himself. You know, that's one of the uh, times that a person is able to find a lot of fault. A lot of times when you're with the people all the time, you don't want to get to think. You're crowd thinking. The Prophet said someone will go off by himself and stay in the mouth here. Now I will tell you something. I went to Mecca. This Mount Hira is not an easy climb. It is very high, very far, very hot. Right? It's not easy at all. The Prophet said someone to go up there and chill. That was his chill spot. Seclusion. Alhamdulillah, I wasn't able to reach the top of it. I had an excuse. We were fasting. It was Ramadan, and my wife, she started to get sick at the time. I don't know if I was going to make it anyway. <laughs> yeah. But alhamdulillah, I had an excuse. So, okay, oh, you're not feeling good? All right, let's just go back down. <laughs> but it's very far up. I don't even know if we got halfway up. And like, subhanAllah, like, the, the things are like, it's not an easy walk. You got to be, uh, huh? Not Hajj, on the Mount Hira, Cape Hira. So, Two things I would recommend that I did wrong was don't go during the middle of the day when the sun is high, and don't go while you're fasting and you don't have nothing in your stomach and no water, because you're not going to make it. And if you do make it, may Allah bless you, you're some type of um, very, very, mashallah. So, the Prophet used to go up here in seclusion. He used to go to seclusion in the cave of Hira where he used to worship Allah continuously for many days. And the hatred for idols and religion of his people was bestowed upon him, and nothing was more hated to him than this, to worship of the idols. Now, the start of Revelation. So all this was before prophethood. We talked about his birth, his father, his mother, the people who took care of him, his foster mothers, his wet nurses, what type of work he used to do. And that's important to see, too. The prophet said something had a job. He worked. He wasn't a lazy, you know, just sit around the house. He was working. He had business. He had some type of tijara. You know? He wasn't sitting around doing nothing. We talked about building the Kaaba, and we talked about him being in seclusion. Now, the start of Revelation. 
When he reached, how old was he when he became a prophet? 40. What did you say, 45? 40. 40. When he was 40 years old, he became a prophet. When he reached 40 years of age, the light of prophet was shining over him, and Allah honored him with his message on a Monday. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, the commencement, meaning the beginning of the divine revelation to Allah's messenger, was in the form of true dreams in his sleep. The first step of revelation was that he would have dreams that would come true. For he never had a dream, but it turned out to be true and clear as the bright daylight. Then he began to like seclusion. Then he began to like to go and be private and be alone by himself. So he used to go with seclusion in the cave of Hira, where he would used to worship Allah continuously for many nights before going back to his family to take the necessary provision of food for the state. And Khadija then used to bother him about this. But it's very important, again, you want to be taller with the you want to become good adid, you have to marry the woman who understands your goal. Look, he would come back, Assalamu alaikum, get some food, and go back to the mountain. The wife said nothing about it. So, mashallah, Muhammad gets food. Right? So, you want to marry the wife that when you go to your library and study, or you want to read, or you want to go to the message, or whatever you want to do, she's like, oh, you just came for the question. Yes, I'm going back. All right? We have money, we have food, everything's taken care of. I'm going to go and do some ibadah. I'm going to go seek knowledge. All right? You need a woman who's going to support you on that goal. Same thing also for the lady. The lady wants to seek knowledge. She should marry a husband that's going to support her in that goal, right? She can't marry a husband that's going to abuse her and take everything from her time. And, you know, he's like, put a marry a woman, that, a man that's going to support her and understand that we need women who have knowledge just the same as much as we need men that have knowledge, if not more. We need women to talk to the women about the womenly issues, right? That they don't know anything about. Sometimes, subhanAllah, women call us and they don't know the difference between hayd and istihaba. It's not okay that a woman can be 30, 40 years old and she doesn't know what her hayd or her istihaba is. You say, man, for 40 years old, what have you been doing for the last 40 years? This is a, you know, a very severe situation. She doesn't know the time when she can pray or can't pray, basically. When she's pure to pray or not pure to pray. This is a dangerous situation. The women have to increase and seeking knowledge. He had come back to his wife Khadija again to take his provision of food likewise, till one day he received the guidance while he was in the cave of Hira. An angel came to him and asked him to read. Allah's Messenger وسلم, replied, I do not know how to read. The Prophet وسلم, added, Then the angel held me forcibly and pressed me so hard that I felt distressed. Then he released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he held me again and pressed me for the second time until I felt distressed. He then released me and asked me to read, but I again I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he held me for the third time and pressed me until I got distressed, and then he released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists, has created man out of a clock, read. And your Lord is the most generous, who has taught the writing by the pen, has taught man that which he knew not, did not know. Then Allah's Messenger وسلم, returned with that, with that experience, and the muscles between his neck and shoulders were trembling, so he came upon Khadija, his wife, and he said, cover me. Now, again, Allah, well, you got to see the benefits of the, our, our mother Khadija. And you got to see the benefits. One thing you learn here is that the man should also be married to a woman that he can confide in. Do you know what confide means? Do you know what that word means? Confide? I mean that you should marry a woman, make her your friend. That makes sense? That if you're going through something stressful, you should be able to go to her and say, oh Allah, what happened? And she should be able to say, don't worry. Not, what's wrong with you? Uh, You marry, right? SubhanAllah, you don't want to, she's going to make it more stressful for you. Men have stress too. Sometimes they don't realize. Men have stress, right? The Prophet says, when he came there, cover me. That's all. Zemiluni, zemiluni, right? Khadija didn't say, cover you for what? I'm not covering you. What's wrong with you? Why are you sweating? What, what? She just did it first. Let me just cover my husband, right? Let me cover him. That's a very important trait for a woman to understand. The husband said, cover me, just cover him. Don't ask him why. Not right now. He'll tell you later if it's a reason. Cover me. Let me cover him. 
become a your husband. Right? And that's it. Then, of course, it's going to tell you. But first, do what he asks. Recover him. He's going through something stressful. Men have these situations. He's going through a problem. So she covers him. Then, after she covers him and helps calm him down, helps support her husband. This is why the Prophet said, loved her so much. After she helped support him, then she waited for him to tell her. Sometimes the women get it backwards. The husband is stressed out. She sees he's stressed out. He's having a rough day. What's wrong with you? Ah, what, what, ah. No, relax. Relax, take it easy. He needs some peace. So, she said, he said, also, oh, what is wrong with me? I'm afraid that something bad might happen to me. Then he told her the story. Khadija said, no, but receive the good tidings by Allah. Allah will never disgrace you. For by Allah, you keep good relations with your kids. Allah Akbar. Look what she says to him. By Allah, you keep good relations with your relatives. You speak the truth. You help the poor and the destitute. You entertain your guests generously and assist those who are stricken with calamities. Look at this. At this time, he didn't need to know. <laughs> Some people, they come and they say, you know, the man when they came and said, oh, something's wrong with you. She said, yeah, something's wrong with you. You didn't pay this bill. You didn't do this. Right? Instead of doing this, instead of mentioning it to him, what she could have said, yeah, of course it's wrong. You've been in that cave for three days and never came back home. The children miss you. Uh, she says, no. She mentioned all of the good things that she could think about from ASAP. This is what you call a grateful woman. This is what you call H? A grateful woman. They say you can do anything with a woman, right? You can fix it. A woman has some bad character. But if the woman is not grateful, can't do anything with it. But a grateful woman, instead of mentioning the bad that she thinks she knows about you, or what you, she thinks you didn't do, that you didn't buy her that new car, she says, oh no, but you smile. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And that's what he needed at that moment. She gave him the exact medicine that he needed at that moment. May Allah bless us to be like this and be better. Than, no, may Allah bless us to be like this. That she gave him, and it's the same thing for the men. We have to be the same way for our wives, right? They need us, right? We have to give them the medicine that they need at that moment. They need some support, some kind words. You tell them, listen, no, of course it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Why? You do this, you do this. She's like, oh, I do all of that? Yes, and you do this. Ask the stuff that she don't even do. <laughs> She's going to think she does it, right? She says, oh, mashallah. He told me that I, I, I cleaned the roof. I, th I knew I did it that day. She never cleaned the roof in her life. But you add that to her so that she'll feel good, inshallah. So Khadija then took him to Walaq ibn Nawf for the son of Khadija's uncle. Walaq had been converted to Christianity in the pre-Islamic period. He used to write Arabic and write of the gospel in Arabic as much as Allah wished him to write. He was an old man and had lost his eyesight. Khadija said to Walaq, oh my cousin, listen to what your nephew was going to say. One of them said, oh, my nephew, what have you seen? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't describe what he had seen. One of them said, this is the same angel, Jibreel, who was sent to Moses. I wish I were young. He added some other statement Allah's messenger asked, will these people drive me out? One of them said, yes, for nobody brought the like of what you have brought but was treated with hostility. If I were to remain alive to your day when you start preaching, then I would support you strongly. But a short while later, Walaka died and the divine inspiration was paused for a while to the Allah's messenger. So that son was very much grieved. That is a benefit here. Look at Walaka told him. This is the truth of Allah. Walaka told him that nobody comes with what you have come with of the truth, except the people treat you hostile. The people will hate you. They'll try to run you out of your own homeland. Is this not the truth? That when a person comes with the haq, the true Islam, right? With no fear, they talk about the Islam the way it should be talked about, the people are going to treat you bad. Why? Nobody wants to, people don't want the truth most of the time. Most of the people are going to be emotionally cold with what Allah said. Most of the people are going to disobey Allah. Most of the people are going to be ungrateful to Allah. Right? So if we know this, when the people say bad about you, when you're giving that when you know you're calling to the right way, should you cry about it? Oh, they spoke bad about me and they got a tough skin. You want to be in da'wah? You got to have tough skin. You want to call to Allah? You can't worry about what people say about you. Why? Because most of the people are ungrateful to Allah. If most of the people are ungrateful to Allah, you think they're going to be grateful to you? Because you come and tell them what Allah says? 
You come and tell them, don't do that, it's haram. You come and tell them, do this, it's, it's wise and crime. You do, you think they're going to be great? Oh, thank you, you say, no. Oh, they're going to be ungrateful to Allah, they're going to be even more ungrateful to you. So if you want to enter into the field of giving da'wah, you want to enter into the field of amr bin ma'ruf and nahan al-munkar, then you better not be a crybaby. All right? You have to toughen up. Why do you think we yell at you so much? We want you to get used to being told they're hearing things you don't want to hear. We want to tell you to get off the wall. Why? Because people are going to do way worse than that to you. You're going to come to them and tell them, give salakah, fear Allah, everything that's good for them, and they're going to spit in your face. You say, oh, you think you're better. Oh, well, oh, why do you want to tell me this? Then when you turn around, they're going to say, hmm, right? You've got to be strong. Why? You've got to have suffer. You've got to have patience. Because what you're calling to, the people don't want to hear. Most of them don't want to hear it. So you have to be patient and don't give up for anything. There's nothing more important about it for Allah Hufiqa than calling the people to that which will save them from the fire. Even if they don't know it's going to save them from the fire. Even if they enjoy what they're doing. You keep calling them. Why? Because that in itself is worship for you. And that will save you, inshallah, from the fire. If you tell the people, you say, listen, don't do the Bible for Allah, people stay away from it. Guess what? It's going to remind you to stay away from that. The people are going to remind you to say, ah, yeah, don't do that. Ain't you the one that told us don't do this? Ah, they're going to, you, the other day you told the people don't do that, and they get in your car and they see a little dirt CD. Right? Do they have CD stuff? You know? They see a little dirt on the Apple phone or whatever? I don't know. Right? They're going to say, yo, Abdullah, wasn't you the one that was, what's this you listening to? Oh, subhanAllah. They're going to check you, right? And you need that. We all need to be checked. So the more that you enjoy the people to do good, the more the people are going to watch you. Wait for your mistake. It's going to keep you on your toes, inshallah. So, again, the rule is, the rule is, that if you call the people, then the people are not gonna, the people are gonna treat you bad. Just expect it. Be sincere to Allah. Don't look for roses when you're telling the people don't do that, it's haram. Don't look for roses, don't think the people are gonna give you gifts. Right? You just told them that what they enjoy doing is haram. Don't do it. You told them they have to do more of this. They're not, they're not gonna bring you gifts and cars and money and say, oh, I should take this thing. All right? So be strong. His Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, he said, while I was walking all of a sudden, I heard a voice in the sky. I looked up and saw the same angel who had visited me at the cave of Hira, sitting on a chair between the sky and the earth. I got afraid of him and came back home and said, wrap me up again. And then Allah revealed the following verses, Ya Al-Mudathir, O oh, you wrapped up in garments, arise and warn the people against Allah's punishment up until the eye and desert the idols. After this, the revelation started coming strongly, frequently, and regularly. Stages of revelation. This is speaking about how the revelation used to come. What were the different ways that the revelation used to come? Because the revelation of the prophet, the revelation of the Quran used to come in different forms, fashions. One was good, true dreams. This is how the revelation started, and Aisha said, the revelation came to Allah's messenger in the form of good dreams, which came true like bright daylight. Number two, revealed directly to his heart. Sometimes the angel will come to him and reveal directly to his heart without the prophet or someone seeing him. As he said, the faithful spirit blew into my heart and informed me. Ruh al -Ameen. The faithful spirit blew into my heart and informed me. So sometimes it will come directly to his heart. Three, it will come in the form, an angel will come in the form of a man. The Prophet telling me said, sometimes the angel comes to me in the shape of a man and talks to me. And I understand and remember what he says. Sometimes the companions were present during this time. A human being will not see an angel except in the form of a human being or something else. It will never see it in its true, true form except when death or what else? A human being will only see an angel in its true form 
when? Two times. That and one else? In the grave. But nah, that is coming. So we learned something from here. These cappers, these tricky cappers, they got tricky, tricky, tricky cappers. They put these uh, pictures, right, <laughs> of these angels, like, you know, all this type of stuff. And the reality is that if they saw the angels in their true form, it's only one of two reasons. The adab of Allah, the angel came to punish them, or it was death. Besides, this human doesn't see an angel in its real form. People say, oh, you know, sometimes people say, look at the sky, say, oh, is that an angel? <laughs> no, it's not an angel. It's a cloud. <laughs> it's a cloud, right? You're not going to see an angel in its true form. If you do, uh, may Allah make it easy for you. So we don't want to see the angels in their true forms, right? Until death comes from us, inshallah, and then we, then we see a good angel. Huh? Enough to see this. No, I mean, you know, it's not the, because then you see the angel is true form, and it's not for Iman. Your Iman is it's a different type of Iman. It's not, you know, Iman is you believe because you don't see it. <sighs> ringing of a bell. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa he says, sometimes it is revealed like the ringing of a bell. This form of inspiration is the hardest of all, and then this state passes off after I have grasped what is inspired. Aisha radiallahu anha added, Verily I saw the Prophet sallallahu being inspired divinely on a very cold day and, no and noticed the sweat dripping, dropping from his forehead as the inspiration was over. Had he been on his mount, it would kneel down to the ground whilst he was on it. That's how heavy he becomes when it's coming. You know, if he was on the camel or horse, the horse wouldn't be able to take the weight. He would have to kneel down on the ground. Number five, angel in a natural form. Sometimes the prophets or someone saw the angel in his natural form when receiving the revelation. This occurred twice, as Allah mentioned in Surah and Najm. Number six, inspiration from Allah. This is what Allah revealed directly to him from above the seven heavens during the night of ascension, layers of Mi'raj. For example, the prayer and other than this. Speech of Allah. When Allah spoke to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directly without an angel as a mediator, just as Allah spoke directly to Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. So those are the seven types of revelation. We'll stop with this page, inshallah. The first revelation was the first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq. The first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq. So who we ask who was the first revelation? The first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq. Recite in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clean substance. Recite in your Lord is the most generous who taught by the pen, taught man that which he knew not. The stages of da'wah. Number one, he became a prophet. Remember we spoke about this before that uh, the prophet, at first he was a prophet, then he becomes a messenger. So the first thing he was a prophet, which means he received revelation. Then he was told to warn his close families. Then he was told, told to warn all of his people. Then he was warning those who no one has come to before, and that is all of the Arabs. Then warning all who received the message from Jinnah mankind to the end of time. So it's important too for us that while we're active and giving that, when we're trying to give that, when we first start with our family and friends, that we start with our family and close friends, that we remind them and say, Yeah, hey. Ya Ukhti, Ya Umti, Ya Abi, Hoya, Abu, right? Sister, brother. We should be active in calling our family members, right? Telling them to the best of our ability with kindness, with wisdom, right? Not with, oh, it's hard, no, oh, I'm going to break. No. Nobody wants to hear that, right? So you have to be wise and smart in your doubt. You tell your little brother, come on, we're going to the message. He says, I don't care. I'll say, yeah, yeah. See, that's a different situation. Your little brother, you can drag him. I don't know if you guys know that. You can take your little brother and throw him in the car. It's different. You can tell your sister, no, you're not going out the house looking like that. Take those eyelashes off. Right? It's true. But when you talk to mom and dad, you can't say it like that. You have to ask them and bathe them. Make to eye with them, please. Use the best of smart ways, even with just older brothers and sisters. Right? 
You got to use the things that work. Give da'wah. The point is give da'wah, give da'wah, give da'wah until you can't give it anymore. Wallahi, if there's 20 of us here in this masjid, that means that there's 20 of us that should be calling the people to Allah. Right? Each and every one of you have an obligation to call the people to Allah to fix the ummah of Muhammad Wasallam. It's not a job for me. Wallahi, we have to understand something. If one person, two people, three, if we all doubt, right? Who's going to stand and give doubt to the people? Who's going to call the people to say this is what Allah has commanded us to do? Every one of you has an obligation. And try it every day. Call someone new to Islam. Call a family member. Start with your little brother. Ah, come on, let's go pray. Oh, you know, let's read a book. Oh, did you? Huh? Every day you should try to call someone to Islam. It's your obligation. You have to call the people to Allah. Who's better than the one who calls to Allah? No one. There's no one who is better than the one who calls to Allah and says, I'm from the Muslims. Right? Start with your family. Don't leave off the ones that sleep in the same house as you. Eat the same. It could be something as small as you tell the person, I say, Bismillah, before you eat. Eat with your right hand, not with your left hand. Right? Something as small as say, Oh, do you know the dua that you said before you go to sleep? You say, No, I don't know. I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to teach you why we say this. You gotta be smart with your dad, right? So the simple like that. Who doesn't want to know the dua before going to sleep? Everyone wants to know that. Why right? you say, man, this will save you if you die in your sleep, right? From punishment. Everyone's afraid when they sleep, right? That they might die. You say, I'm gonna teach you something that will help you. Say, after kursi, recite this. Let me tell you what this means. Your dad doesn't have to be a long 30 minute khutbah talk. Talk for some one, two things. And every time you give them some more, you say, ah, oh, let's go, you know, let's make salah. Did you pray here already? You know, salah. They say, I'm going to go to, if it's your sisters, right? And they might not come to the masjid. You say, oh, listen, I'm going to go to the masjid and pray. Make salah, sister. Now, it's in right now. Even maybe if you lead them in the salah, and then still come to the masjid. Right? To make sure that they pray. Don't be the person who becomes good for themselves and it doesn't affect the people who are around you. The Prophet said that the best of the people are the most beneficial to the people. Be beneficial to the people who are around you. Don't be afraid of people laughing at you because you want to give da'wah. Because, you know, the good thing about giving da'wah to your family first, right, is this, is that they know you. Do you understand what that means? That sometimes it's easy to give da'wah to people who don't know you. Because you can act like Sheikh bin Baz with them. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, do you know Allah Ta'ala, he says this. And they're like, wow, MashaAllah, this guy is like big Adam Kabir. Right? But you go to your sisters, and you say, yo, sister, yo. She says, get out of here. Just yesterday, you were doing such and such. Ah, go clean your room. You're like, oh, man, <laughs> my room is dirty, right? But that's okay. Because it teaches you what? Humility. Do it for the sake of Allah. And it teaches you perseverance. Once you can get your family to listen to you, then you, alhamdulillah, you reach a level of, especially if it's your sisters or your brothers, your parents, they might take you a little seriously because they have a soft heart for you and it's always trying. But your sisters and your brothers, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to tell you to go somewhere. If they're older, but they might slap you in the back of your head. Shut up, right? But you have to be patient. And you have to keep calling them. And you keep calling them. The Prophet said, Son of his own uncles. And I said, Muhammad, what are you calling us for, man? Calling us on the army is coming. That's all you have to say? I said, that's all I have to say. Don't be afraid. Make sure every day try to call your family members. Call your brothers and your siblings and your sisters. You see them, you know, listening to something that's haram. You know, I remember some haram. I would go and turn the thing off. Turn it off on them sometimes. Like, ah. They say, oh, they might beat you up. And you get up and say, alhamdulillah. Do it again tomorrow. Right? What is it worth? Is it not worth saving your family from the fire? Should we not be interested in that? You know it's haram, and they might know it's haram, but some, we're weak human beings. We're weak. Should you not want to help them? Even if they beat you up, laugh at you, they don't want to feed you, it's like, oh, you keep acting like I won't cook for you. It's okay. Is that not enough hardship to save them from Jahannam? It's enough. It's worth it. So 
take that seriously, you go home. You say, no, don't do that, brother, sister. Oh, there's a wedding coming up, sister, you're not going to go. And I'm going to beg my parents not to let you go. Why are you mad? Oh, why are you trying to stop all my fun? You know, it's okay. You can call me a boring and all this type of stuff. I just want to save you from Jahannam. Make to offer them. Be sincere about it, though. Don't just do it just to bully and like, oh, I just want to mess up everything and be a party fool. Be sincere that you want to save them. That you want to change the society that you live in. If we're going to live in this country, then you have to do some work. It becomes haram for a person to stay in the lands of the kuffar if they're not doing work. You understand that? So make sure that if you're going to be here, you're doing some work. You're making da'wah. You're trying your best to educate the people about Islam. The levels of the da'wah of the Prophet he began first with a secret da'wah that he only told people in a secret. And this was for three years. He would just tell a few people, hey, listen, you know about Islam, let me tell you something about Islam. And that's what we can think about here, right? Your da'wah might have to start slow, quiet. Might not have to be in the streets and everything like that, right? Start with your family and your close friends. Become strong in that manner. Then he made da'wah in the open. When he was commanded to, then declare what you are commanded. So then his da'wah became open. The first believers, you know, I'm going to say something again really quick because I just thought about this. Allah, in every family, alhamdulillah, you see that there's always, you know, at least one really multazim, like strong, mashallah. Believer, alhamdulillah. Sometimes it's two or three or four. But sometimes the sad situation when we see in one family that there's one and the rest of the people are like, yeah, I'll pray maybe and I might not pray and this type of thing. It's what happens though, right? But what do we do to stop? I mean, we, a lot of guys who we want. But don't be not active. Don't be the one who just gets used to the fact that I'm going to go save myself and my family is just going to do what they're going to do. That makes sense? Sometimes we get used to it and it becomes normal that I'm going to do what I have to do with my family and just, you know, that's just my family. Keep calling them. Even though today they don't want to listen, keep calling them, keep calling them, keep calling them, keep calling them. Because the guidance is in, for, uh, is in the hands of Allah. We're just told to make that one. So keep calling your family until one day we fill the message it up. Men and women. We fill it up with our family members, right? That should be our goal. That we fill the message up that the city becomes full of obedient Muslims to Allah. Not just like play play, but obedient. Imagine if each one of us called our family's property, what type of effect that would have on the city. If we weren't lazy, if we didn't just like, you know, that's my family, and they're going to do what they want to do. So please, if you don't take anything else, take that serious. Go home and call your families to, to, to worship a lot better. All of us together. The first believers from the men was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. From the women, it was Khadija bin Quwaylid. From the youth, it was Ali bin Abi Talib. From the freedmen, Zayd bin Haritha. And from the slaves, Bilal bin Rabah al habashi Those who proceeded in Islam, from the early ones to believe in him after those who we mentioned were his family, then Uthman ibn Affan, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, Uzubair ibn al-Awwam, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Khabab ibn al-Arat, Suhaib al-Rumi, Ammar ibn Yasir, his mother Sumayya, Abu Ubaid al-Awwam ibn al-Jarrah, Uthman ibn al-Mad'ul, Abu Salama ibn Abdul Asr al-Utbah, Ibn al-Ghazwan, radiyallahu anhum, ajma'in. It would be very good for each one of you to look at the biographies of these early Muslims. Because you'll find so many amazing, 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 amazing stories that will motivate you to be better and better and better. Any questions? Tell you, since there's no questions, I hope and I pray to Allah that we allow ourselves to become serious upon khayr, and we be serious upon inviting the people to good. Spread the good. Don't leave it for yourselves. Hada wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalwa an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.